want to know who had a really awesome fall break these last couple weeks? I think this section is the most excited. I give it a three out of 10. So I want to know, what is the coolest thing that you've done this fall break? What's the coolest thing? Sophie? The chicken house. Let's go. Let's hear for the chicken house. Riley? You went to Waffle House for the first time. Wow, your standards are really low, but I love it because, man, if your standards are low, that means Waffle House will give you a killer, killer uh, fall break. What else? What else do we have? I love Waffle House. Field of Screams. That sounds, that sounds terrifying. That sounds terrifying. How was it? Was it good? Was it fun? Cool. Cincinnati, okay. Owen? Cool, very cool. Out in the back over here. We'll say it one more time. Okay, awesome. All right, one more. Let's get one more. You right there. You have to have your hand up a while. Yep. The Ark. Okay, the Ark encounter. Super cool, super cool. Okay, we'll get one more right here. What do you got? Alabama. That's cool. I just went to Alabama a couple weeks ago. It was pretty cool. Um, so that's awesome. Sounds like you guys had an awesome fall break. My favorite part of fall break is we got to go to Fields of Faith. Anybody go to the Fields of Faith with us last week? Yeah, there's a handful of us in here, okay. So the cool thing about Fields of Faith is they have like FCA clubs and churches and youth groups from all over Southern Indiana. And we all came together um, in New Albany at this indoor park complex. And it was just really cool. We just got like, to all come together. We actually had three of our high school ESM students get to speak and lead worship on stage, which was really cool. And then Pastor Luke back here, he got to preach the gospel to over 150 students, middle school and high school mixed students, which is really cool because there was like a stack of cards this thick afterwards, and each card represented one student who gave their life to Jesus. So let's give it up for God for that, because that's incredible. And last week we talked about when you give your life to Jesus, man, you're going from the world's team to God's team. You're going from the devil's team to Jesus's team, right? We talked about that last week. And what did we talk about? What do we have to be ready for when we switch teams like that? What do we got to be ready for? Does anyone remember from last week? Yeah. That's right. The devil gets really, really, really mad. And those words, exactly. I love that. He gets mad. We got to be ready for his attacks and he's going to come at us. And guys, this is a real thing because these past three weeks, I've gotten to do some really exciting stuff for God. I've gotten to hang out with you all at the fall retreat a couple weeks ago at Wonder Valley. I got to go to a mission trip in Arizona. We had fields of faith last week. Just all sorts of really exciting stuff for God, and I've gotten to live through that, and I went from just talking about being a kingdom worker to actually living it out, and it was super cool seeing you guys with me in a lot of those things, and it was really exciting, but man, the devil's just been hitting me with a lot of sickness, and it's been kind of hard, and there was times when I felt like the devil's lies were coming into my head, and they're like, hey, just call out, just sleep in, just, uh, there was a time where I wasn't even sure if I was going to get to go on the mission trip that I paid for and raised money for, and it was a little bit frustrating, but I was like, you know what, I'm not going to listen, I'm going to power through, and it's real. Satan wants to slow us down. When we commit to living for Christ, he's going to throw things in our way to try to get us to slow down for living out our four, and uh, this week we're talking about the second lie, so let's go ahead and pull that up on the screen here. The second lie we're talking about today is your past defines you. Your past defines you. There's sometimes in life when there's things in our past that are just really haunting. It's really, really difficult. And when we talk about the lost, that's our second core value. We should be trying to seek the lost. Students who don't know Jesus. And God so desperately wants to tell students like that, like, hey, I have a future for you. You don't have to be stuck in the past anymore. I can rewrite your story. But sometimes it's easier to hear that than believe it because a lot of times, man, our past can stick. Guys, God's mission is to reach lost people through us. But Satan's mission is to keep people lost. He wants to keep us lost. He doesn't want us to find hope, to find a new future with Jesus. And the thing is, guys, like we have a lot of memories from our past. We have good memories, maybe like of Christmas morning, maybe hanging out with our friends, going on a fun trip or a family vacation. And we have these good memories, but isn't it interesting how the bad memories or embarrassing memories tend to stick out in your head the most? Is anybody else with me on that? 
maybe like an embarrassing memory or a, a bad memory. Um, maybe it was a time that you messed up something or did something embarrassing in class or said something. You're like, man, why is it so much easier to remember the bad stuff versus the good stuff? Like there's just something about bad memories that stick. For me, it was when I was in high school on my JV basketball team. And any ballers in here? Any other ballers in here? There's a couple of you. So there was always this one drill our coach would make us do. Like if we like messed up a lot or at the end of practice, he would say, okay, we'd be dead dog tired. We'd run tons of down and backs. And then he's like, okay, everyone get on the baseline. Man, if you hear that, that can never mean anything good, right? If you're on a basketball team, he's like, everyone get on the baseline. So we're on the baseline. He's like, each of you are gonna take turns shooting free throws. And if you miss one, the whole team runs half court and back. If you miss both of the free throws, the team's going to run full court and back. And man, people were laying bricks. People were hitting the rim. People were missing. We were just running like crazy. I was dead dog tired. And then the coach, about halfway through, we, were, we weren't even halfway through the team yet. And the coach says, okay, I need one volunteer. And if this person drains both shots, we're just going to call practice done for today. And you know, I got really bold and I was like, I got it, coach. So I walked up, I was like, I got this. So I get to the free throw line, I'm lining up my shot, I even spin the ball to myself a couple times, and then I go to shoot it, I'm like, I got this, guys. Boom, smash it off the glass, like it wasn't anywhere close, and my whole team was like, oh my gosh, they were all like saying mean things to me, they were like, that's so embarrassing, I was so like, man, you're causing us all to run, and we had to go through all the players after that because I missed that free throw. And it's memories like that, embarrassing memories where people give me a hard time about it that stick in my head more than the good memories. So we, we need to know that sometimes our past can be sticky. Sometimes things that are sticky stay. Today we're going to be looking at a story in the Bible about a woman who had a sticky past that she felt defined by. And it comes from John chapter 4. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me there. John chapter 4, verse 5 and the Bible doesn't tell too much about this woman at first. The only thing you see is that she is going to a well to get water, but she's going at a time of the day that no one else would be there. She had things in her past. She had mistakes. She felt embarrassed, and she felt so embarrassed that she went to the well to get water during a time of the day when no one else would be there. Maybe that's like you. Maybe you did something embarrassing. Maybe you're struggling right now, and Maybe sometimes if you do something embarrassing and you're worried about going to school the next day because people might make fun of you, has anyone ever planned like a route at school to like get to class where you could see the minimum amount of people? Maybe you even like hide somewhere and like come in late so you don't have to walk past a lot of people. This is what this woman was dealing with. She felt embarrassed about something in her past that we're going to find out here in a couple minutes, but she came to the well when no one else was there. So let's read the story together, starting in verse 5. It says this, eventually Jesus came to the Samaritan village of Sychar near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there and Jesus, tired from a long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water and Jesus said to her, please give me a drink. He was alone because his disciples had gone to the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Now something in this story that stands out to me is that this woman lived in the Middle East. And the Middle East is really hot. It's like deserts, like a thousand degrees in the summertime. I mean, it is really, really hot. Um, I know because I've been to the Middle East once for a mission trip and it was really warm. Like it was way hotter than anything you've probably experienced here. Uh, in America, and she went to this well in the middle of the day when it was like a thousand degrees, because to her, she would rather go through a thousand degree heat to get water than deal with people judging her, than deal with people defining her by her past. That's how hurtful it was to her, and if there's anything that this story shows us is that we, it, other people, what they think of us can really have an effect on how we define ourselves. What other people think of us can really have an effect on how we define ourselves. And maybe this morning you've bought into this lie. The devil has gotten you to buy into the fact that the world defines us by our past. This is a lie that the devil wants you to believe. 
that the world defines you by your past. And for you, it might look like this. Maybe you did something embarrassing in class and people gave you a nickname because of whatever you did and it was just really embarrassing. I know for Chaz up here who was leading the game this morning, he fell asleep one time in a staff meeting here at Eastside and now everybody calls him Dozer. So sometimes like things from our past can stick and they can like call you names. Maybe it looks like someone on your team because you missed the free throw like me, or you missed the field goal that would have won the game, and people are giving you a hard time saying you're not good enough, you're not going to amount to anything, you stink. They might say rude things. Maybe it's someone in class saying, hey, you're ugly, you're this, you're that, someone's bullying you. And after a while, you might start to believe it. You might be like, you know, I'm just a loser. I'll never amount to anything. That's what this looks like in your life. When you start to let the world tell you who you are and you actually believe it and you actually define yourself by what they're saying, it's really easy for this to happen. And the woman at the well, this is what was happening to her. I'm sure she started to believe like, hey, I'm, maybe I'm always gonna be this way. Maybe I'm always gonna be stuck in this rut. So let's see what happens in the rest of the story here, continuing here. Jesus replied, if you only knew the gift that God has for you, and who you are speaking to, you would ask me, and I would give you living water. Anyone who drinks of this water will soon become thirsty again, but those who drink of the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh, bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water, then I'll never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come here anymore to get water. And then Jesus said, go and get your husband. Um, Jesus told her, I don't have a husband, you don't have a husband. And the woman replied, you're right, Jesus said, you don't have a husband, for you have five husbands, and you aren't married to the man you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. So this is one of these oh snap moments, right? Like Jesus just called out almost every mistake this woman has made, and she didn't even mention it. This was what she was hiding. This was her past. This is what the world was defining her by. And in this moment, Jesus just says all the things that the people around her were defining her by in her past. And this woman, she was obviously searching for something. She was trying to fill a void in her heart. And for her, it was relationships. And she hops from relationship to relationship to relationship. And like someone trying to drink salt water, so they wouldn't have to be thirsty anymore. She keeps going back to the very thing that made her thirsty in the first place. Guys, doesn't it sound like us? When things are going bad in our life, when, the, when we're feeling thirsty, when we feel like we need validation or meaning or love or acceptance in life, we go to things that will always leave us thirsty and we keep going back to it. Maybe for you, that, like her, that's a relationship, having a boyfriend or a girlfriend and you don't feel validated unless you have one. Maybe for you, it's simply going into your room, shutting the door and playing video games or sitting on your bed watching TikTok for hours on end. Maybe for you, it's doing things you know you shouldn't be doing like partying or or maybe it's finding like somebody who in your school has the jewel or vape and it's something like that. Maybe for you, you're searching for things to fill your heart and it never truly satisfies. And isn't it funny how when the answer was standing right in front of her, she kept going back to something that would always leave her thirsty. Guys, this morning, Jesus is standing right in front of you, but so many times, instead of going to the living water, instead of going to Jesus, we run back to the very same things that leave us thirsty in the first place. Jesus is standing right in front of her, and she's trying, she wasn't trying to judge her, she wasn't trying to expose her. Jesus was saying here, he was saying, hey, look, you've been searching for love in all the wrong places and the answer is right in front of you. Stop searching for love. Stop searching to fill your thirst with these other people over and over again and come to me because I can give you living water and you'll always satisfy. And Jesus is about to show her a major truth here in verse 19. The woman said, sir, you must be a prophet I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ, and when he comes, he will explain everything to us. And then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. Just then his disciples came back and they were shocked to find Jesus talking to a woman. But none of them had the nerve to ask, what do you want with her or why are you talking to her? The woman left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village telling everyone, come and see the man who told me everything I ever did. 
Could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village to see him. Guys, it's so crazy that a few minutes before, the woman was standing with the answer, and she didn't even realize it. She probably felt like, I'm always going to be stuck this way. I'm always, my past is always going to define me. It's always going to be difficult. I can never get over this. And a couple minutes later, she has an encounter with Jesus, and everything changes How crazy could it be that this morning, just a few minutes ago, before you came in here, you came in with your past, you came in with your baggage, you came in with the sins that you are struggling with, and you feel like there's no answer in sight. How crazy is that a few minutes later, Jesus had an encounter with you right here this morning, and he is the answer. He is the living water. He is the one who helps us overcome our past to give us a new future. Jesus is trying to tell the woman, it doesn't matter what other people say about you. It doesn't matter how you beat yourself up and what you say about yourself. I am the only one who can define you because I created you. And this morning, Jesus wants to say, hey, leave your past here. I want to give you a new future. Guys, will you trust Jesus with your future? See, here's the thing uh, about the world. The world always is looking at the rear view mirror. And I have this picture up here. The world's always trying to get you to look in the past, look at your mistakes, look at the things that you've messed up, rewind and look at all the bad stuff in your life. But if you're driving a car and you're just looking at the rear view mirror, what do you think is going to happen? Yeah, you're going to go backwards or what else? You're probably going to crash, right? If I'm just sitting there driving, look at the rear view mirror, I'm going to hit somebody. Uh, my life is going to go off the rails. It's the same thing in life. If we're just looking at that rear view mirror like the devil wants us to do, and we feel defined by that, we're never going to have any direction in life. We're always going to be crashing into things or ro- going backwards instead of forward, like Riley said. It's always going to be that struggle. But God's over here saying like, hey, that past, you can glance at it if you want for a second to see where you've come from. But I want you to look forward. I want you to look at the future I have for you. And Satan gets us to look at this little tiny mirror when God's saying, like, look outside this windshield. See this new life I have for you. See this new future. I can rewrite your story. Guys, do you believe that? Do you believe that Jesus can give you a new definition for life? Do you believe that he can rewrite your story? I want to share with you really quick, a quick video of an ESM high school student in her high school ministry, and God rewrote his story. Check this out. Last weekend, whenever we were playing soccer, I tried to kick the ball out of the air. I completely just flipped over and fell on the ground. It was super embarrassing, but it was pretty funny. My name is Kenneth Perry. I am a senior at Jeff High. I moved here from Iowa when I was a kid about a year ago. And for a while before that, I hated everyone. I hated the world. I was just really mad at everything. I really felt like no one liked me. I would let the smallest thing that went wrong with the day, like if everything just didn't go exactly how I wanted it to, I would just let it ruin my day. And I would just let it consume me until I woke up the next morning. I guess I really just, I felt like I was ugly. Uh, I felt like everyone was judging me every time I would just walk into the room. And I just really felt like I wasn't a likable person. I realized that Jesus loves me and no matter how bad things may go, how bad anything may go, Um, everything else can still work out and at the end of the day it's not gonna make me lose sleep so it shouldn't make me upset when it happens and anything that I may do wrong Jesus is gonna forgive me for it I gave my life to Christ because that is how you get into heaven that is what Jesus would want I needed to give the throne of my life to Christ and let him rule over so I could truly experience joy. My past doesn't define me because Jesus has already defined my future. This is uh, our friend Kenny, and he's such a great dude. He actually was one of our ESM students that got baptized a few weeks ago at Pathway. And one thing his story shows me is that 
it stands out to me like in a huge way because he was letting his past define him. He was letting what other people said or, or worrying about what other people thought, and he was letting those judgmental thoughts define who he was. But then he realized, Jesus defines me, and everything changed in his life. So I don't know who you are. I don't know what sins you're stuck in right now. I don't know what your struggle is. I don't know what family you come from. Maybe you've had a really rough experience in life, have a rough home life. Things have been hard at home. Maybe there's things in your past and difficulties you've had to come through to get to this point, and we don't even know about them because you hide them, because you feel ashamed of them, you feel embarrassed by them, you feel hurt by them. No matter what you're struggling with this morning, I know one thing, Jesus has the power to rewrite your story. And you might feel like, hey, it's too late, I've gone too far. Guys, I can promise you, it is never too late for Jesus to rewrite your story. When I went on a mission trip to India, I saw one of the coolest sights ever. I saw a 97-year-old get baptized and give his life to Jesus. Man, if that doesn't tell you that it's never too late for Christ to rewrite your story, think again. Like you guys are in middle school, Christ can rewrite your story today, and you'll have most of your life to live for him, and he's going to give you a new future. He's not going to define you by your past. He's going to give you a clean slate. He's going to help you live for him. Will you trust him with your future. Let me pray for us. Um, dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for everyone in here today. Thank you for fall break and getting that rest. God, I pray that these students can be rested up for school. I know it's a bummer at school tomorrow, God, but I, help, I pray that you help them get through the day. God, I pray that you give them the courage to be missionaries for you, to live out the four, to share with others the love of Jesus. And God, I pray that every student in this room who's struggling with their past, who's struggling uh, with things in their life, who's struggling with mistakes they've made or embarrassing moments, help them to know that, yes, sometimes those things happen, but that doesn't define them. Help them to know that only you can define them, Jesus, as your precious son or precious daughter, God. Help them to believe that. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.